Hello, everyone. My name is Meredith Steinfeld, and I'm one of the pr program planners for the Men's Health Caucus. Today, I will be moderating this webinar. Please feel free to leave any questions or comments in the Q&A chat box. Toward the end of the session, our speakers, Dr. Leon and Dr. Sutton, will spend some time answering your questions. My co-program planner, Albert Pless, will also be sharing some next steps with you later on in the webinar. But for now, please allow me to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Jim Sutton earned his PhD in sociology from Ohio State University and is an associate professor of sociology and chair of the Institutional Review Board at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. His areas of emphasis are criminology and criminal justice, and he has specializations in violence, gangs, and corrections. Much of his earlier scholarship extended from a multi-year data collection project that he conducted in multiple men's prisons in Ohio. More recently, he completed 34 in-depth interviews with survivors of murder victims, and he is now working on a book that sheds light on their experiences. He regularly teaches courses on penology, police and policing, juvenile delinquency, criminology, and social deviance, and his published works have appeared in the Journal of Criminal Justice, Violence Against Women, the International Journal of Offender Therapy and Comparative Criminology, the Journal of Gang Research, and Deviant Behavior, among others. We will also be hearing from James E. Leone, who has been a professor of health at Bridgewater State University since 2008. Dr. Leone earned his PhD in health education from Southern Illinois University, an MPH in urban public health from Northeastern University, and an MS from Indiana State University. Dr. Leone has held faculty appointments at the George Washington University, Northeastern University, and Southern Illinois University. He has also served as an adjunct lecturer in the Physician Assistant Program and MPH programs at Northeastern University in the Bouvet College of Health Sciences. He has published numerous peer-reviewed articles and has delivered well over 200 research presentations. Dr. Leone's academic interests include strength and conditioning, male health, body image, drug abuse epidemiology, health disparities, celiac disease, and issues in professional development. He has written several textbook chapters in addition to his own book on male health titled Concepts in Male Health, Perspectives Across the Lifespan. He holds certifications and or licensure in athletic training, strength and conditioning and health education and serves as a board reviewer and associate editor for the Psychology of Men and Masculinity, Body Image, an International Journal of Research, Health Behavior and Policy Review and Obesity Science and Practice, as well as various professional journals. Now I am going to pass it over to Dr. Sutton, who will begin with an overview of violence from a criminology perspective. Okay. Thank you, Meredith, and thank you everybody for being here. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to have the opportunity to participate in this event today. Uh, like a lot of people, violence was a fact of life for me growing up, and it's something that uh, affected me deeply. And yeah, I never really stopped thinking about it from an early age because it was you know, what we might call a focal concern of mine. And so uh, as a result, much of my professional work ever since I was little has focused on themes related to violence. And so that's why it's a, a privilege for me to have the opportunity to participate in an event like this that's geared toward trying to make a positive difference. Uh, I'm going to share some slides now. And uh, my goal with my presentation today is to help you think a little more about violence in ways that maybe you haven't always thought about before. Uh, you know, I have my email address up here, and so I, I like to think of this as maybe the first step of a conversation that perhaps I'll continue with some of the people who are here, so feel free to email me anytime. Um, and because I always uh, have done the prison uh, stuff in the past, I, I continue to keep this slide for my introduction, uh, and that's the Auburn Correctional Facility up here in central New York. Um, and so if you're interested in violence and you want to do some reading, I have a few books here that over the years I've found to be particularly helpful. Uh, the Macho Paradox focuses uh, pretty extensively on themes related to masculinity and violence, uh, framing violence as, against women as a men's issue. Uh, Why They Kill is a classic that focuses on, uh, you know, 
aggravated and, and homicidal violence and does a really nice job of showing the consequences of brutalization from an early age and exposure to violence in the household, uh, you know, how that can lead to continued violence later on. Uh, the Anatomy of Violence does a nice job of uh, summarizing various fields of research uh, in the biological sciences, uh, evolutionary psychology, uh, it presents it all in an accessible way. Uh, and then finally, you know, after the crime is one that's a little different that focuses on restorative justice programs, and in particular, the experiences of victims and survivors. We're often focused uh, on the people who do violence, uh, but we also need to remember that violence is done to people too. And so I like that book. I also have an additional book uh, that I'll uh, quickly mention. It's a memoir, uh, Leaving Dorian, by an author named Linda Dinell, who I believe is in our audience today for the webinar. Uh, this is a fantastic firsthand account and one that I would recommend uh, for sure to anybody. Now, as far as uh, you know, my background, you know, I'm a criminologist and criminology is a very broad and interdisciplinary field. Uh, but some of the things that we tend to focus on are describing patterns and trends and you know, types of crime, for instance, uh, looking at causes and, and correlates. Sometimes it's hard to uh, determine exact causes, but we can start to get a sense of, of if nothing else, uh, common themes that tend to recur, reoccur each time we have violent incidents. Uh, some of us focus on using sophisticated statistical analyses to uh, predict future outcomes. And then, of course, we ultimately are often trying to figure out why violence and victimization occur, how they're experienced, uh, and what sorts of policies and, and interventions and punishments uh, might work uh, in terms uh, of responding to these issues. And so I think, you know, this is obviously more of a, a public health uh, emphasis today. Um, you know, I think criminology can, can inform public health approach by helping to, you know, identify some of the, the, the context, uh, you know, that, that can then be used to drive prevention. You know, as far as, you know, what we're even talking about, you know, we, we should probably ask the question, what is violence uh, to begin with? And, you know, there are many ways that we could conceptualize and define violence. I'm going to read an older definition that I've frequently seen over the years, or some version of it. Uh, and it is behavior by persons against persons that intentionally threatens attempts or actually inflicts physical harm. Um, you know, I, I don't know that that's incorrect, but it's maybe incomplete. Uh, I like this definition here because, you know, for starters, it's not just a person that can be targeted. It can be a, a group or a community. So hate crime is one example there. You know, I, I also like that, you know, this definition from the World Health Organization uh, focuses on more than just physical harm. And, and certainly, you know, when you look at psychological harm, you know, the trauma, sometimes uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, certainly if we only think about violence as something that inflicts physical harm, you know, we're missing uh, a big part of the story and, and uh, the root of a lot of the, the profound difficulties that survivors and victims of violence experience. Now, I, one thing that I, I would really like to underscore uh, is that violence is very diverse. Um, you know, one thing that I have up here in the top left-hand corner is a diagram uh, that tries to convey that we have multiple types. And this certainly, none of these are exhausted by any means. Uh, but when you look at what criminologists have often studied over the years, and, and certainly themes that I've studied too, you know, we, we often look at gang violence, homicidal violence versus, uh, you know, maybe 
relational and domestic violence or sexual violence. And of course, you know, you can have more than one of these occurring at the same time. There are other forms of violence too that aren't represented in that diagram. If I put everything, it would get messy very quickly. Uh, violence that occurs because a corporation perhaps willingly uh, ignores safety protocols uh, and puts employees at risk. Uh, sexual harassment, bullying, stalking, uh, and so many more. We're often used to thinking about types of violence, but I want to encourage you to think about other ways that we could look at violence too. And this is certainly something criminologists do. Uh, we can look at, you know, anything from timing and planning, right? Whether it's a one-time incident or it's an ongoing pattern, we're going to have very real differences uh, in terms of perpetrators and their motives, in terms of uh, the experience uh, that victims have, whether it's spontaneous or premeditated. And if you think about intervention, if we're trying to solve problems, then we, we probably are going to need to recognize that we'll need to have multi-pronged solutions that address these different, uh, you know, modes in which, you know, it occurs or different timings uh, and so forth. Um, you know, whether it's gun violence, which I think a lot of public health uh, scholars have been interested in, rightfully so, right? Um, but we have violence that occurs through manipulation of trust and power, uh, coercion, you know, physical aggression, as well as other weapons too, right? Um, and then motives as well. And so I have power assertive and power reassurance, which is an older typology that I've always liked. Uh, some people perpetrate acts of power or acts of violence because they are coming from a place of feeling powerful and entitled. And it's simply an expression of how they feel, whereas others uh, maybe don't feel very powerful and violence is a resource. And so I could certainly go on and on here, you know, two more diagrams that I would have put up if I had space would be nature of relationship. Uh, violence is going to vary depending on if it's done by a stranger, an acquaintance, an intimate partner, a family member, or the setting, you know, it can happen in the home, the street, uh, in an institution like a prison, uh, or even on the field, like a sporting event. And so that brings another question uh, to mind. You know, are we only thinking about criminal violence? We have a lot of other acts that many would consider violent, uh, but if they're on a field, then they may be celebrated instead of prosecuted. And so, you know, my goal here is ultimately, you know, to, to underscore the fact that violence is very diverse. And so one challenge is it's hard to come up with the perfect conceptualization because there are so many different kinds uh, with so many different facets and considerations. Um, but with that said, you know, we also know that violence has a lot of commonalities too. And so, you know, I have in the arrows here in the middle of this diagram, uh, what I see to be the main uh, components of that real health organization definition, you know, violence is the intentional use of power or threat or force against the target uh, resulting in harm. Um, I've added two parts to this, uh, perpetrators and then victims and survivors, because, you know, I think those need to be foregrounded. In that definition, we don't have uh, you know, foregrounded acknowledgement that perpetrators actually do this. And when we take the time to look at perpetrators, we see that there are a lot of, uh, you know, patterns, um, correlates. For instance, as Dr. Leone will talk about, you know, violence is overwhelmingly perpetrated by boys and men. Uh, all of those types that I've already discussed, uh, it is a, largely a masculine enterprise. Uh, if we look at victims and survivors, um, you know, we, we see a lot of variety there, uh, whether it's somebody who's directly targeted, um, but also people who are often overlooked, like the vicarious victims, family members, the survivors that I'm uh, studying right now proxy victims that are, are victimized because they represent in the perpetrator's eyes uh, the, the real target that maybe they're angry at, uh, and then broader communities too. And so, 
you know, when we look at common correlates, you know, criminologists for years have been identifying them, you know, and Dr. Leone will talk about more, some of the ones I've found interesting over the years, uh, exposure to violence, being a uh, victim of violence yourself, uh, community level predictors, and so forth. And so, you know, we can look at all of that as we start thinking about how we might intervene. And I think one of the areas where public health and criminologists are both uh, coming together is uh, around this theme of different levels of intervention. And so uh, primary level interventions address the community as a whole and, and tend to address community level risk factors that anyone could potentially encounter uh, versus secondary, uh, which focuses on people who are identified as being at risk um, but they aren't quite there in the cycle of violence that maybe, you know, we, we would see if we're looking at tertiary interventions. And, you know, when criminology, you know, we, we look, among other things, at how our criminal justice system has different layers that intervene at these different levels. And so my goal here has been ultimately to help you start to grasp what I do, you know, when I think about violence from a criminological perspective, and also to, to set up maybe a different way of thinking about disciplines. There's sometimes this tendency to think about disciplines as being distinct, whereas, in fact, we have a lot of overlap. Uh, we have criminologists who, who do public health work and vice versa. I think very generally speaking, you know, we can think of both of these fields as being similar and that they have similar interests and concerns. Uh, they're both increasingly evidence-based, and I think that's important uh, when we're talking about correlates and so forth. Uh, we're not just inventing this out of thin air. The, the data uh, show these patterns to be there. Uh, but criminology might do you know, a little more in terms of contributing to illuminating some of these problems. And then public health uh, does certainly a lot more, I think, at development of solutions. And so I think I'll end my comments there for now, but we'll certainly have time later on uh, during the Q&A session. And I look forward to engaging uh, with the discussion more then or through an email if anyone would like to follow up that way. Uh, so thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Sutton. Now that Dr. Sutton has given us a criminologist perspective on violence and victimization, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Leone, who will frame this from a public health perspective and talk about the factors that lead to violence, as well as a few examples of violence prevention methods. Wonderful. Thank you, Meredith. And it's great webinar weather here in Massachusetts. It's uh, gray and overcast all day. So let me bring up my slides and we'll get right into it here. Um, again, thank you very much, Meredith, uh, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Jim, for the perspective and overview of what criminology does in terms of violence. It's, it's kind of an ever-present topic that we bring to you every year in some form or fashion. Um, I'd also like to thank the Men's Health Caucus for kind of bringing together these timely topics as you know, we talk about these, whether it be criminology, incarceration, or uh, communities as a whole. So, of course, I was given the task of speaking to the public health perspective. So here goes. Before I do so though, um, this was some more recent research from one of the journals that I um, edit for and review for. And if you notice down here in the results section, right? It says results suggest that men's desire to own firearms may be connected to their masculine insecurities. A lot of stuff in that very brief uh, sentence. So desire to own firearms, so it's a desire. Um, and it's connected to this thing that we don't always put a proper wrapping around, right? Masculinities, not just masculinity. And basically, as Jim talked about, efforts should be made to understand how do we kind of disaggregate that so that one thing isn't synonymous with another. So I just wanted to start off with a little bit of um, what that means in the context of what I'll be talking about. So what you see here in order to properly contextualize violence from the public health perspective is what we call the social ecological model. Many of you may have heard of it or used it in some form or context. So as, as you look at this, please note the relationships and interconnectivity of the various levels as they affect all of our lives, whether specifically or in general. Or if you're trying to simplify it, you know, what does this mean to you? The health of one is impacted by the health of many. So in that term, think of herd immunity, right? The health of one is impacted by the decisions or actions of many. 
or the health of many can be impacted by the one individual. So in that case, think of like patient zero with you know, a certain infectious disease. And the plague of violence is no different when we consider this broad concept and its impacts on individuals and of course the communities in which they reside. So starting off, just kind of a little overview of um, epidemiology, uh, specifically webs of causation. We use these to try to understand an issue more fully. Um, obviously in this case, we're talking about male violence, but I've also included a couple of graphics. The one on the left-hand side, as you can see there, shows different pathways towards substance abuse and addictions. And the one on the right relates to our topic today of male violence. So male violence has several components. Some of them are, as Jim noted in his presentation, some of these uh, bigger sociological um, constructs and systems. And of course, some of the others are a little bit, you know, more related to the individual. So the experiences of the individual in terms of achievement of education level, living in poverty. I'll talk a bit more uh, about adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And of course, some of the other factors that are bigger, right? So more the sociological components of we all live in a political area. We all are impacted by climate. We're all impacted by our race and cultures. And while no model is all inclusive, they do help us to appreciate the interrelatedness of these factors concerning that central phenomenon, obviously, which is the topic of today, which is male violence. Um, the utility of webs of causation are we can group them, test them, statistically predict what are the strongest models with hopes of developing those preventative and palliative programming uh, initiatives. So let's shift our attention to exploring some of the stronger and more validated contributors of male violence so that we can get more into what are some of the possible solutions to that. So I'm not going to go through all of the, uh, the, the data on the left hand of the slide there in, in very, very brief overview of it. Men lead in pretty much all the areas related to uh, violence and violence related consequences. I will highlight that uh, central row. So if, if you look at the um, the, the numbers there, why should we collectively care about male-centered violence? And again, the data only tell part of the story. While those aggregate data that you see there help us realize that there is a problem, those data also, de in my opinion, dehumanize each and every tragedy behind those numbers that extend well beyond any single person. Um, in addition to the summary stats on the left-hand side of the slide, that percent of male involvement show a range of violent behaviors, right? So we're not just talking about uh, murder, we're talking also about things that lead to uh, other forms of violence within our communities that impact you, maybe not necessarily directly, maybe it's increasing in taxes, right? So there's this whole connection point that I think we need to take pause here and understand what is it? Why do some of these stats go well beyond the 50-50 probability? So, you know, if you flip a coin, any statistical class, you'd expect to get 50-50. Um, why is it so skewed towards one area? Or simply say, what is it about males that drives a lot of these numbers here? So as you digest that slide, um, I'll talk a little bit about um, the general prevailing theories of what does influence male behavior that translates into violence and the violent outcomes that you see in the slides here. I believe also we will be making these slides available either through the webinar recording or other means. So don't worry if you're not getting all the data down and, and writing everything down there. So as I mentioned, generally speaking, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more on the prevailing theories of violent behavior from a biological, psychological and social perspective. Uh, when viewed from you know, the 30,000 foot view, we can see this coming together in a biopsychosocial model. So a lot of stuff to kind of uh, disaggregate there, but let me just kind of touch upon a few of these. So biologically, much of this perspective comes from soci sociobiologists who investigate things like dominance hierarchies in the animal kingdom, right? We're, we're always part of this animal kingdom, but we always like to think of ourselves as you know, different than it. And you know the theory there is he who wins gets whatever they want. Um, this extends to young, poor males who have the highest rates of violent behaviors. However, violence is also lower in the same groups with higher SES. So we can see that it's not just an animal kingdom thing. Last time I checked, you know, lions don't have bank accounts or Bitcoins or whatever. So there is something different in terms of when we provide for people, particularly younger males, they tend to adjust better. And when, when people tend to adjust better, we see lesser of what you saw in the previous slides there. Uh, genes certainly show markers in some familial lines. So some families, of course, have family members with antisocial personality disorders. 
Uh, there's also been research on structural brain anomalies. And of course, our discussion today would be incomplete if we didn't talk about testosterone and violence, right? So chicken or egg there. Um, however, in a lot of the research that I'm aware of, testosterone may be the cause of aggression or it may be an effect of being aggressive. So it's kind of the data is still very un unclear in terms of what that actually means. Shifting over to the psychological components, uh, some research shows violence in males and people in general may be organic, again, through structural brain changes or hormonal neurotransmitter anomalies. But it, again, in my opinion, the caution should be exercised here because considering that most people who experience psychological difficulties, whether mental health challenges or, or organic brain disorders, are not violent. So, you know, again, people that commit crimes, for example, with firearms typically do have some sort of psychological problem, but not everybody that has a psychological problem is going to go out there and pick up a firearm and commit, you know, some uh, atrocious crime. So I think that's very important from the psychological standpoint. Um, also, from the social standpoint, and then I'll bring it together with biopsychosocial, sociologically, there's, there's no lack of social reinforcers for violence, be it on the internet and in movies, television programming, or even cartoons. You know, if you go back maybe to some of your cartoons, if you watch them when you were younger, you know, I, I forget the stats, but, you know, there are actually more acts of violence in cartoons than even in, you know, generic movies and things that we've seen throughout the years. Um, a lot of the theories around social, of course, there may be a dose response relationship and to this, the result in violence. So said simply, males learn how to be masculine and to some extent, the sources they access contribute to their perceptions of what violence is and then even how to perpetrate it uh, if they get to that point. So this can, of course, occur through parents and parental modeling as well or vicariously through media and other sources. So when we bring all these things together, uh, and we take the former into account, violence is a product of something versus an issue in and of itself. Okay, let me say that one more time. Violence is a product of something versus an issue in and of itself. And what are the costs? So relative costs associated with male violence, you know, again, going back to that comment of, so why should we care? Um, from the previous slides, males are nine times more likely to be incarcerated than women. And at the cost of, this is 2016 data, so it certainly uh, has advanced, roughly to the tune of 80 to $100 billion per year. And this only considers the financial costs. So often left out of the conversations are the cyclical nature of incarceration that Jim talked about, that also takes the male out of his family, community, employment, and many other civic and familiar responsibilities. This leaves families broken, partners on the fringe, children without stability, and contributes to one of many adverse childhood experiences that have been shown to greatly impact children in terms of maladjustment, behavioral disorders, particularly as they age. And you saw that in uh, Dr. Sutton's literature and research as well. Research also consistently shows that they males are likely to experience at least one adverse childhood experience before the age of 18, and a larger percent experience three or more, which probably explain a lot of the maladjustment issues as they get older. These issues are undeniably captured in the mounds of data that you've previously seen on my slides, as well as in Dr. Sutton's. And when viewed from a masculinities lens, males are also not only victims of experiences of more ACEs, they are also more likely to then go on and perpetrate them, especially against other males. Um, but because they shoulder this hegemonic masculinity, or you know, in some terms, we call it toxic masculinity, it's not exactly something that they can speak about. So simply said, if you've experienced an adverse childhood experience and you're expected to ex um, act according to this hegemonic masculinity theory, you then are not supposed to talk about it. So you repress it. And that repression, we all have emotions, often comes out as anger, which then leads to some of the consequences that Dr. Sutton talked about. Um, so kind of wrapping up here, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll comment on a few of the, the ways that we can actually make things better. Um, masculinity is a monolithic concept, but it actually is masculinities because we can leverage it, right? We can use it in terms of what are the innate qualities that males and females can use in masculinity. So, uh, you know, I'm more interested in your questions. So I'll be brief with this. But if we accept that violence is more of an outcome or a product of how males engage with those masculinities, or at least more so than what biology and other factors, you know, ascribe to masculinity, we can actually use and leverage that to impact violence and violence pre uh, prevention. CDC does a wonderful job, by the way, creating a lot of graphics and a lot of 
um, model programs that can be used to actually address a lot of these issues. Um, so simply stated, violence is a social product that does have a solution, but we must know how we got there first to figure it out and how to shape and alter it. And in my opinion, it's careless to simply say that males are just born that way or it is what it is. You know, uh, We must give up on the mentality that males should experience anything more or less than the standards with which we hold up the ideals of equity. And that's also in terms of years of life, disease, violence, or wealth, which males are often less likely to experience the benefits of, probably with the exception of wealth. Uh, oh, so, uh, sorry, to conclude here, and then we'll get into some of the questions, I've included a few resources, just like doc Dr. Sutton um, included. Um, I'm a big fan of bystander trainings where males are able to leverage their perceptions of masculinity when they're posed with a complex issue. So for example, think of like locker room talk where somebody might be talking about something you know, inappropriate or misogynistic or, or violent. That's an opportunity for one person or a couple of people to say, hey, I'm not okay with that, here's why. And what we find in the research is when there's one that stands out, there's often a few others that will be more tempted to speak out as well, which kind of quells the issue, right? It's kind of like putting out a fire progressively. Um, but we need to do a lot of work in terms of making sure we, it, we imbue this in macro level systems, sports, social activities. Uh, I was reading yesterday a, a bit on computer programming and I'm by no means a computer programmer, but uh, in that process of writing computer code, when the correct sequence is formatted, the rest kind of sorts itself out. The negative patterns can be broken. So uh, masculinity development and a lot of the outputs can be modified. We just have to do a better job discussing them, identifying them, and then working with that code to kind of reprogram the whole process there. So similar to Dr. Sutton, I'd like to thank you all for listening and thank you to the Men's Health Caucus and APHA for hosting this and other types of sessions here. And I look forward to your comments and questions and ideas. So I will throw it back to Meredith. Thank you, Dr. Leone. Now that we've learned about violence and victimization from a criminology and public health lens, we are going to hear from Albert Pless, the chair elect and program planner for the Men's Health Caucus, who will review resources and work that is happening in the field beyond this webinar. Albert, you are muted. How's that? Can you hear me? Perfect. Yep. Perfect. All right. Let me just move my. Okay. Um, I just want to go over a few slides with you. Can you see my slides? Great. So we talked a little bit about the Men's Health Caucus and a few next steps that I think we're excited about with our Men's Health Caucus. One, just want to give you, you know, what we are. You know, the Men's Health Caucus advocates for the needs, health needs of men, boys, and their families, including health awareness disease prevention, screenings, early detection, and treatment. Again, and this fits into our overall focus that we're doing. So we're glad that we had this webinar on, um, on violence and criminalization. Um, just want to share a little bit of our team. Um, we're excited about this team. Some folks are moving around a little bit. Um, thank Brandon for kind of ushering in our work as a chair uh, until November, and I'll take on that mantle then. And then thanks, Jim um, and others for their support. Meredith as my co-planner, with our with our sessions, we just finished up the um, our session um, planning process for APHA this upcoming conference, and we're excited about that. Um, just want to share with you a few of the workshops that we're having um, at our upcoming conference. Um, we're doing cancer and men's health, focusing on um, health equity in men and boys. Um, what's going on with Black men's health and programs um, and strategies to advance the equity of boys and men. So again, just this focus on equity, which is the theme of APHA this year. So we're excited again about, um, about that, um, about that, sorry, about that, about that um, focus and center in our work on equity. Um, we do also excited about our policy agenda that we're focusing on there. So we'll share a little bit more about that APHA and some next steps about rolling that out and the implementation of that process. And thanks, Jim, for your work around that and moving that work along over the last few years. We're excited about the next steps. And I guess I want to share with some resources that we are, and this, again, this webinar um, um, presentation will be available to you after this, but these are some resources. Some of them are highlighted in Dr. Sutton and Dr. Leon's 
um, presentation focused on, again, this broader concept of violence in men and boys. Again, so we can share these resources with you. And a lot of these are available on the web, but we wanted to kind of keep, you know, seven, say seven to 10 of them in one space for you, um, for your, for your reference. Um, and so again, we're excited, you know, about, you know, this webinar, we would love for you to join us as members. Um, again, we'll share with you more in the chat box around how you could become a member. And we also have an evaluation in there um, for that. So I'm gonna pass it back to you, um, um, Meredith, so we can take the Q&A for this um, next portion. Thank you, Albert. Now we're going to open up the floor to questions. I see a few have already come in to me via private message, but if anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to leave them in the Q&A chat box. So the first question is for both speakers, but let's have Dr. Sutton start. The question is, what can parents do to promote positive masculinities in their children? Um, <clears throat> don't engage in negative masculinities, uh, would be my first answer. Um, and maybe beyond that, I, I think obviously, yeah, I, I have a kid that'll be five in a few weeks. And so I am thinking a lot about this and, you know, modeling what you want to see and, and talking uh, about this seems very important to me. And, and maybe most important in terms of what I'll say, because it's often not said, is uh, these aren't just discussions to have or things to model with boys, but girls too. And so, um, you know, th those would be my my first thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a great question. Um, I, I always go back to thinking about like micro level interactions, right? Microaggressions or micro positive things that we do, you know, whether it be parents or role models. And those are times and opportunities to either make or break relationships, right? And ultimately, the things that we do as human beings every single day are relationships, right? They're interrelated based on everything we do, whether it's ordering a coffee or holding a child, right? So ultimately, I think what we need to do a better job in doing is naming things, you know, helping younger boys, especially name what it is that they just experienced, not every single minute, right? Not every moment of the day, but when the parent or the caregiver is noticing something, explain, what, what are you feeling, right? What, and what is that? You're feeling this, what do we call that? And that creates that level of, I wrote down in my notes, even before the webinar, connection. And we find that the greatest level of issues with males are younger, poor males that feel disconnected. That 18 to 24 year old uh, window of, of life that creates most of the consequences that then we deal with after that. So as Dr. Sutton said, you know, criminology and the incarceration system, that all tends to be a little bit the consequence uh, version there. So I would say it comes back down to being mindful of things, naming feelings and emotions and expressing them appropriately, and then helping those boys and of course people connect with a certain level of empathy and social consciousness. And can I just add something uh, on that? I would say also uh, along those lines, interrupting the narratives that uh, reinforce those destructive masculinities Dr. Leone talked about. Um, sometimes, and similar to when, when Dr. Leone was talking about bystander training, sometimes the common narrative that keeps replaying and re is constantly, uh, you know, reinforced by everyone in somebody's life. Uh, if there's one person who interrupts that narrative, that can be very powerful. Thank you for those answers. So this next question was directed to one of Dr. Leone's figures, but once you answer, we will give Dr. Sutton the opportunity to respond as well. And the question is, when discussing the web of causation, you pointed to factors on different levels, such as more overarching factors like power and hegemonic masculinity and individual factors like perceived status and risk-taking. Are there any interventions to prevent violence and victimization that address factors on multiple levels? Kind of a complex question. So if you need- Sorry, I, I lost the screen. I was trying to go back and forth there. So if I'm understanding the question, is there kind of a, a one shoe that might fit all of those different categories? <laughs> I think that's kind of what the, the question's aiming at. Yeah, I mean, 
I would say scientifically, my answer is no. There's not, you know, a single thing that will, um, you know, ameliorate a lot of those issues. But going back to the to the science of looking at those bigger constructs within that web of causation and loading them into, you know, equations that can give us more of a relationship of strength, right? So is one thing more related to that central theme of whether it's male violence or whatever it is, and then understanding how do we pick that apart, right? So uh, Dr. Sutton and I were talking before the webinar about like, you know, how these things are so interrelated, right? He's a criminologist, sociologist, I'm public health, I've done, you know, more of the medical work stuff, and we need each other. And public health is one that literally steals, borrows, and begs from all different disciplines to try to understand what those models are. So I need Dr. Sutton as much as he needs to use a lot of the stuff that we do to create those preventative programs. Um, there's a lot of diverse examples out there, but it's really a question to, to, to kind of be su summarizing this. I think it's really a question of, do we want to impact societal level change? And do we have enough resources to do that? Or do we work more towards the individual? I will say in the United States system, we spend a lot of time and money on systems that focus on the individual at a great cost, both personally, professionally, and monetarily. And the output isn't as great as what we would hope. So it's like ordering a you know, really fancy dinner and getting you know, a happy meal. Sorry if you like ha happy meals. Um, so no, I, I don't think there's, there's a one size fits all, you know, here's the greatest impact. I think we need to follow the data in terms of those strengths of relationships and then use programs that have been modeled after that to attend to whatever the central issues are. And I'll add to that, um, in the therapeutic realm within corrections, uh, so like probation in particular, and some of the work in prisons, they have the R&R model, risk needs responsivity. And uh, that's a data-driven approach that's geared toward identifying individuals um, you know, criminogenic needs and risk factors. And those can be a range of, you know, what we might call predictors, uh, lack of employment or education, um, as, as well as adverse, you know, childhood experiences. And so it's an individualized uh, assessment tool that then is constantly being, you know, reevaluated as uh, the practitioner is working on each of those needs. And so uh, sometimes it's called a dynamic dynamic model, right? That That's an area that tends to have a strong evidence base. And so uh, in terms of corrections, that's maybe one place where we see some uh, hope. Uh, and then just in terms of uh, another program that comes to mind, um, there's Homeboy Industries, and so it, for people who might have an interest in violence and uh, gain violence in particular and, and prisoner reentry, Homeboy Industries is often seen as a model, and they're developing an evidence base there, uh, and they do all kinds of things. They, they, the Father Greg Boyle leads it, and his saying is nothing stops a bullet like a job, uh, but they also have counseling. They do tattoo removal to cut down on stigma, um, family support, education, because it is all of this, right? And, and that's a place that, that has uh, done its best to try to take a multi-pronged approach. Thank you. Those were great responses. Okay, we have one question from Hannah. So the question is, I recently graduated with my MPH and found that my program really didn't touch on criminology or violence much, if at all. Why do you think that is? Do you think there, that, do you think there should be a class dedicated just to this topic? And do you have any suggestions for bringing up the importance of this topic so that it is talked about in public health programs? Maybe um, Dr. Leone, this would be more geared toward you for, first response? Yeah, I, I, again, I know we have the, <clears throat> excuse me, the core five public health, you know, areas. Um, I think it's kind of like medical education training, you know, that people can seek out either ancillary coursework, you know, given your topic of interest, or, you know, maybe curriculums do need to do a better job in infusing modular lectures into some of these 
broad areas. So for example, you know, we talk about, if I talk about health education with primary schoolers all the way through high school, can you teach all the complex subjects with a health theme, right? So can we teach English literature using health and math using health? Why not, right? So I would say in the public health curricula, again, it's been a while since I've been in it versus teaching it. Um, I would say similarly, maybe we need to choose, you know, topical themes, maybe every quarter and, you know, utilize that as the model to unpack a lot of these bigger issues. So a lot of great ideas though, definitely. Yeah, I would just add to that. You know, unfortunately for a lot of people, graduate programs fall short in terms of not providing what you might hope they provide. Uh, if you're lucky, you go and, and the program has a specialty you want and you're able to, um, you know, pursue it. But for a lot of people, regardless of the field, I think sometimes you, you may need to eventually be that person who provides it down the line because it wasn't provided for you. And you may need to do the things like attending this webinar today to, to satisfy that uh, interest because it wasn't provided by your program. Uh, I, that was, you know, in some ways, my experience, I was in a program that had a strong criminology focus, but not necessarily on the all the topics I necessarily wanted to focus on. And so maybe my response would be the, the inspirational, uh, you know, cliche, cheesy thing that's true, right, it is maybe you can go provide that in the future uh, somewhere, because you know, it's probably not being provided as much. Um, and that's where these kinds of interdisciplinary collaborations are, that's why it's so important, right? I, I think a lot of people are so used to, to hanging out in their own little sectors and, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully more of this will happen and hopefully maybe you'll be the one who teaches that criminology program someday, uh, or maybe Meredith will. Uh, We'll see. Okay, next question is from David. What environmental shifts could we make in a community or society to help men create those empathetic forms of connection? For example, the emphasis on competitiveness within academics, media entertainment portraying men not asking for help. Either one of you, I think, could take this one. I guess, I, I mean, it's a complex question. Um, I think it's being intentional and specific about how we approach every experience with males from, you know, zero through whatever age. And as Jim talked about earlier, it starts again with caregivers and parents, <clears throat> excuse me, who have to then be the moderators, I think, of that boy's upbringing, you know, whether it be access to media, social media, all those different things are opportunities. And you know, giving a little credit to parents, you know, there, there's so much to deal with every single day. It, it's, it's maddening to even think about how much they would have to curate to help that boy understand his experience. But I think a lot of that often is just kind of sidestepped. There's so much, it's overwhelming. So I think in addition to helping the boy himself appreciate what these things are and naming what they are, I think we need to have support systems for parents to be more aware and, and help them to have time to be more aware because ultimately it's the complete cyclical process of parent role model child and then hopefully creating enough of that resiliency i think you know jim can probably talk a lot more about resiliency with you know work with incarcerated individuals um, but i think a lot of it is that you know how do we build on those core values what do we want those core values to be as a community to then enact them as the child gets older yeah, and I, I would add to that, and this is my, my sociology side coming in, um, you know, something Dr. Leone quickly referenced earlier, and some people may have missed it, is it's masculinity is not masculinity, right? Uh, and masculinity is the plural is so important because, uh, you know, gender is diverse uh, and even masculinity, very diverse. There are different masculinities including different masculinities at different times for the same people. And so, you know, one thing that strikes me is if you want to 
make change in a community, look, look at which forms of masculinity are maybe validated or reinforced or serve as the basis of uh, people coming together. You know, is, is it only sports that, that might reinforce those hegemonic forms of masculinity? Uh, you know, the reality is most men, uh, even ones who have a hegemonic uh, masculine side, may have other times in their lives where they're nurturers or, or doing something else. And so is there a reward structure? Is there an opportunity for those men to find each other? Is, is there some way in the community of highlighting and bringing attention and validating those roles? So it's not just a narrow form of masculinity that's being uh, represented, validated and reinforced, um, you know, and, and how you do that, I don't know, but uh, if you ask me to get to work on it, that that's something that I might be thinking about. And, and, and just quickly building off of that, you know, the former question was about, you know, what can we do from societal or community-based service? You know, service is a form of, of helping. It's not attached to any form of specific masculinity, but it certainly is encompassed by, I want to be there. I'm going to run to a certain need. I'm going to identify people's suffering and I'm going to attend to it. It's a, it's a very, think of it from this standpoint, it's a very practically oriented approach. And what we often praise traditional masculinity for being is it's action oriented, right? It's going in and whether it's negative, attacking somebody or something, war, battle, whatnot, but it's also, I'm doing something, I'm building something, I'm building connections, I'm building a home. And I think service is something that we can really um, hone in on because I think it's become more and more of a component in a lot of faith-based organizations, high school education as well. So maybe if we kind of leverage that form of masculinity, like doc, Dr. Sutton's talking about, that can be a more uh, practical output of what that system could be. Thank you. Um, and one of the final questions, what barriers do you see when doing this work? What challenges are there? Dr. Sutton, do you want to take this one first? Um, <laughs> there are a lot of ways that my mind goes when you ask me that. Uh, I, I think, you know, maybe the first is, you know, sometimes these destructive forms of masculinity are successful, right? And so um, that that's one challenge. Why, why do these continue? Why do we continue to see these patterns? There must be a reason. Uh, and maybe, you know, one reason is obviously they're reinforced and people are making money off it when you look at, you know, media sensationalization and so forth. But, you know, uh, the reality is for some people, dominant destructive forms of masculinity uh certainly if nothing else in the moment get them what they're trying to get and so i see that as being one challenge or barrier um and then you know maybe another challenge goes back to the the question as far as uh representation of these themes and let's say graduate programs um you know even in criminology you know, we don't have masculinities being one of the main themes focused on, uh, which is always uh, discouraging to me. Um, and so if you look at the people who are doing this work and teaching classes and so forth, they have a lot of reach. And so what are they not telling people? And so I see that as being another barrier, uh, which again is why uh, a webinar like this and other ways of maybe thinking outside the box are so crucial. I think a barrier is we're not very good about talking about it. Um, it's assumed. And a lot of these issues around behavioral patterns are assumed to be either normative or, you know, we see the extremes of the issue. So I think one of it is talking about what, you know, what is my masculinity? What is my approach towards people that may have a different understanding of what that even means? And, you know, I, I, I wrote down a note as far as media, right? So when I was growing up, you know, as a younger child, not that old, but as a younger child, you know, we had a lot of imagination games, right? And full, full uh, honesty here, yeah, I had my toy guns. We would play all sorts of, you know, the politically incorrect games. We would shoot them up and do all this stuff, right? So probably not the best model of in today's context, but, but let me be very, very specific. 
those games and the way in which boys and girls and people play were using your imagination to try to understand how do you assemble your reality. And what we've seen a shift towards with internet, video games, and a lot of these other types of mass social media are we're told how to play. We're told the script, right? We're, we're literally given the script. You might pick up you know, a toy gun or something like that, and then you're emulating or, or basically replicating maybe something that you played or saw. The imagination decreases and the outcome becomes more rote or automatic. And I would argue that that's probably one of the central themes of how certain people grasp onto these masculinities from compromised backgrounds, boys who have experienced multiple adverse childhood experiences, lack of parental role models, lack of emotional ability to connect to each other. And we see it kind of play out in that script versus I use my imagination. Some things might not be so cool, you know, based on today's society, but I end up on the other side of the tunnel doing reasonably well. And, you know, there's a host of other issues as barriers there, <clears throat> excuse me, I think one of which of course is socioeconomic status, um, you know, that there are reasons why certain groups of boys are attracted to certain types of outcomes, whether it be gangs or um, other ways of connecting and how they then develop and use and leverage their masculin masculinities either in the positive or the negative. So uh, a lot of that kind of, you know, in a very cloud form there. So sorry for the weird response. Maybe I'll just quickly add to that, you know, a related issue. Um, you know, men are, are part of a society where it's pretty much impossible to not be complicit, right? Uh, whether it's playing a violent sports or listening to the violent music or, or what have you or previous experiences. And so sometimes it's communication, right? You know, men that we need as allies might feel attacked uh, if we point this out. Um, and so how do we manage that, you know, helping people see without pushing them away uh, when we do it? And I certainly see that as a challenge whenever we talk about these themes in a classroom on a college campus. Thank you for those responses. So we have one more from Ken. Um, and this is a pretty broad question. So is masculinity the primary cause of war and how might we address it to reduce war? Is this why we often hear about innocent women and children, not including men? And um, I don't know, Jane, uh, Dr. Sutton, you aren't muted. So maybe I'll pass this one to you. Um, take a stab at it and then we'll give Dr. Leone an opportunity to respond. Well, I think uh, it's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, I don't know that it's, and I'm certainly no expert on war. Uh, so I, I don't know if that's the main cause. I think that was the phrasing. It is interesting, though, that it tends to be, you know, a, a, a men's enterprise. I mean, look at war, men and boys who tend to wage them and, and fight them. And so, you know, that that's intriguing. But, you know, wars are also about politics. Uh, you know, some would argue about money and, and all of those are also masculine domains largely. And so I, I would assume that masculinity is a part of this in some way, or at least it's uh, a common denominator, uh, you know, with a lot of the other, or I'll, I'll say this, I think masculinity is probably interrelated with a lot of the other correlates of, of war. Now I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, I'll just be brief there. I know Albert has some uh, parting comments for us. Um, I, I think the, the, my direct answer to that is no. Um, you know, I think, uh, again, to what Dr. Sutton said, I, th I think it starts even as with the individual, it starts with a conflict, right? And the conflict isn't a bad thing. Conflict just means I'm not quite so sure about where I am. So if it, that's the individual, a community, an entire government, right? You're saying something's not right here. I'm in conflict with it. Whether or not that conflict then leads to some form of outward aggression, Right? I'm aggressing towards myself, I'm aggressing towards a, a friend or a foe or whatever, or a country versus another country, that becomes the process. And then that's what we might label as war, right? All the nasty things that go along with that. And then we suffer the consequences, whether individually or as a society with the results of war, as we've seen around the globe over time. So I wouldn't say that masculinity 
is the cause of war, but I certainly would agree with Dr. Sutton that it, it's kind of a, it's not going to not be there. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So I think it's a, that's a fascinating question. And I know we've, we've agreed to do a little extra time with questions if people have them, but I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet there. And I know Albert has some things to say. Um, I'll just be brief. Again, thank um, Dr. Sutton and Dr. Leona for this presentation. Um, again, this is a, uh, a good way to kick off our fall season and getting ready for APHA and as we begin to dive, dive deeper into our men's health work. So again, thanks, Meredith, for, for your awesome uh, moderating of this session. Um, again, you did a great job from beginning to end. Let folks know, again, this was webinar organized by you. So I want to give you a shout out on, on this on this uh, at this moment. So I'm going to pass it to you for for closing comments. Thank you, Albert. I think that's a great note to end on. Um, I just wanted to personally also take a moment to thank our speakers from today, Dr. Sutton and Dr. Leone, as well as Albert and the rest of the Men's Health Caucus for prioritizing these important conversations. And um, to our guests, please feel free to follow up with us if you have any further questions. And with that, I hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.